Okay, well, welcome to the September 29th uh, City Council Rural Select Committee meeting. We are being audio and video recorded. Laura, would you please um, do the roll call? Sure. Councilor Mayori. Here. Vice Chair Simon. Here. Member Baskin. Here. Councilor Dwight. Here. And Councilor Foster is not yet present, but to join shortly. So I'm going to use my chair discretion and move public comment um, after and approval of the minutes after um, the agenda item timelines associated with fi financial orders. Um, question and answer discussion with Mayor Narkowitz, since the mayor has um, a, a commitment and can only stay for a little bit. So, yes, yeah, so Mayor Narkowitz, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Mayori, and thank you to the members of this select committee for inviting me. Um, I understand the question that you're asking, and so I'm happy to just speak to it. Um, you know, I, th I think it's important to sort of understand the sort of the history of how I think how this system evolved. Obviously, prior to the adoption of the modern 2012 uh, charter, uh, you know, in 2012, um, the mayor uh, was the chair of the city council. Um, and actually was the chair of the finance committee. Uh, the finance committee was, you know, a council committee, but the mayor was the chair of it, um, sort of de facto, and the, and the mayor and the finance director sort of uh, set the agenda for the finance committee and, um, and sort of drove that. There was actually another committee as well, EDLU, or Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use, which was another committee of the council that was chaired by the mayor and actually the mayor and the economic development director sort of drove the agenda. It had counselors on it, but the mayor was the chair of it. Um, and so um, and so I think that the uh, the sort of the tradition or the history of the finance committee being sort of baked into at least one of the meetings being baked into council meetings sort of grew out of that tradition um, because all sort of financial orders get driven uh, you know, must be uh, submitted by the mayor. They they must emanate from the mayor and um, like the budget, et cetera. So I think that's sort of how it came about. I mean, I always wondered about the process as well because it is definitely unlike any of our other um, committees where, you know, something is introduced and then it gets referred to a committee. Um, so when 2012 happened and the, the um, you know, the separation of powers uh, occurred, the formal separation of powers, um, you know, I was actually, you know, one meeting I was chairing the city council, um, and then the next, uh, I think, uh, I, I was then no longer chairing. Um, and so, um, but, and so, you know, everything kind of got untangled. The mayor obviously was no longer the chair of those two committees, um, was no longer, um, you know, part of the agenda setting. And, um, but I think the council, because it was sort of the tradition and, you know, it, it did sort of work very smoothly. Um, sort of kept that nomenclature of the finance committee, um, you know, sort of appearing um, at the beginning and um, and then, you know, continuing. And, and so so I understand the concerns about it and I understand it is different than all the rest um, in terms of the normal uh, uh, legislative process. And it's even different than other city councils that I'm familiar with. You know, most have a, have a finance committee and, and orders get, get um, referred to it. So I would, you know, I'm, I'm obviously would defer to the council on what it chooses to do um, with this in terms of wanting to restructure it. Um, I guess the only thing I would ask sort of two sort of two concerns that I would raise about it, and it just would be something depending on how you decide to change your, the rules or amend the rules that you would be mindful of. And that is um, first, uh, you know, there are circumstances where um, there are strict timelines for needing to make a financial order or transfer. Um, uh, and so, you know, having the ability to waive referral uh, to the to that committee um, would be, I think, important. Um, you know, I can think of, you know, uh, one very uh, common one that happens year after year after year is, you know, there's the final, usually the final meeting um, it's, it's the first meeting in July, but it's the last opportunity in the fiscal year to make final transfers, uh, to move items around within the budget before the actual cutoff on July 15th. So typically, uh, the, the finance director will bring a slew of orders at that July meeting, 
um, to just true up accounts. We're not appropriating new money, we're not spending new things, but we're sort of moving uh, monies around to make sure that no accounts end in deficit. So obviously that would be hard to do um, and it would be hard to do well enough in advance because it's, it's an end of year exercise. Um, so having the ability to waive referral there would be good. Um, and then, you know, there's just other things like, uh, um, you know, we, we may have a capital project uh, that needs some additional funding. Um, you know, I think of like the Academy of Music. Um, we've got an order coming before you at the next meeting. Um, the Academy of Music ran into some additional unforeseen costs in their project. Um, they're actually going to pay for it. Uh, they're going to put money forward to pay for it. Um, but it's, you know, obviously it's a construction project that's in process, so we need to get that funding approved, um, you know, and so those types of things. And then there's just the emergencies where, you know, we may have to um, emergently appropriate funds for some kind of, a, you know, emergency repair, or occasionally, you know, there are even instances where the building commissioner, you know, has a major um, health or safety hazard um, and needs to emergently have an appropriation of funds to address it. Um, typically doesn't spend those funds, but um, because typically the property owner ends up paying for it. But so I can think of several examples where having the ability to do that in an expedited fashion would be helpful. So, you know, I guess um, that would be, that would be one thing I would um, just want to make sure that it was not going to be like a everything always must be referred that there need to be some flexibility um and you know the council has the ability to waive its rules you know with the exception of referring appointments to uh your your city services which is a requirement of the charter um you know you should be able to waive them and then the only other consideration would just be um staff time and you know the understanding of whether or not um, you know, I mean, obviously, one of the other advantages to the system we have now is that, you know, the finance director comes to the finance committee meeting and, you know, all the other counselors are sort of there as well. And so they hear all the information. And so then when it moves into the council meeting, then, you know, um, then there's, uh, you know, they, they've sort of followed the conversation and understand it. So, you know, I guess the question would be, um, you know, what would be the, you know, what, would the finance director come to the finance committee and then also come to the city council meeting as well? I, I would kind of want to understand that piece of it. Um, and, you know, obviously if, if the finance if director and the mayor um, came to the finance committee and um, explained it to the council and, or to the finance committee, and then the finance committee made a recommendation to the full city council, then the question would be, would the, you know, would the finance committee make the ex explanation to the full uh, city council or, you know, et cetera. So just some logistical things in terms of um, staff time and, and just understanding what would be, what the expectations would be, I guess. Um, but from a pure like, you know, statutory, um, other than emergencies or other than, you know, these sort of end of year transfers where um, there's, you know, just by virtue of the exercise at the final end of the year, when you're, you know, making the last payrolls in June and you're making the last bills in June, you can anticipate what tr what final transfers need to be made in that July meeting. Um, you know, having the flexibility to do that would be important. So I guess that's my um, take on it. Thank you. Um, before the mayor has to go, does anyone have any questions for the mayor on this? Dwight. I would say we, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I would also go say, ahead. I would just say we, you know, we also, under that old tradition, always had an off council meeting on the books or at least on the calendar. Um, it was often the fourth Tuesday or some, yeah, I think it was the fourth Tuesday. And so there was some business that happened in the finance committee that didn't happen at the, um, at the main meeting. And again, it was, um, it was on a as needed basis for things like, you know, I don't know, TIFFs or, or, um, or just maybe audits, maybe um, more meatier issues that um, were not just a pure council order sort of thing. So, you know, it's not that we haven't had these off meetings, um, but uh, so I just wanted to also point that out. It hasn't been utilized lately, um, but again, I think it was more when the mayor chaired it, it was an opportunity for the mayor uh, to be able to use that 
forum to be able to begin introducing something to the council at the committee level um, before it uh, and get feedback from the finance committee um, before advancing it further. So. Thank you, Councilor Dwight. So um, thank you, Your Honor. And, and actually you should know that part of the conversations have been around the issue of second reading, the, the unique exercise that's done by this uh, council. And one of the things that uh, Councilor Foster hit on on our last meeting that I took to calling the, the Foster epiphany, which <laughs> is that if, if we eliminate the necessity for two readings um, or two votes, as it were, we call it two readings for reasons that still pass understanding. But the, what that allows us to do is to treat financial orders, not unlike the way we treat any orders that come through, is we, the first reading is when they're introduced to the council and then they get referred to committee. And then whereas where it stands as the second reading, it would actually come before the council after the finance committee has reviewed it. So that allows us to establish a freestanding separate finance committee meeting in the inter intervening time between council meetings, which addresses a lot of the problems and challenges, I think in some, in, in a rather large way that allows more public access and comment uh, in, in subcommittee. It also, as far as staff time goes, it, it does, I think, um, avoid the uh, fact that, for instance, we would have Susan Wright sit sometimes till midnight before she got to make her presentation, you know, the finance committee, uh, the finance director. In this case, they would be the agenda item. They would be present at the, at the finance committee meeting that's devoted exclusively to those issues that were referred to it. So um, hopefully... It, one of the concerns, one of the reasons I, I had asked for you to come speak was to talk about uh, state established and DOR established uh, clocks that start ticking that create the, the um, sometimes the necessity for, for, sec, uh, for you know, doing two readings in one meeting. So uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message from Karen Foster. I don't have my phone, so can't text Laura and Rachel. I'm in the waiting room. Can you help me oh, get into no. the meeting? So <laughs> if you can. Right now. Sorry, okay. I'm <laughs> All right. So. Looking at my notes. Um, so that, um, I mean, that's the thing that also passes understanding for us, or that we're not clear on, is what are the time constraints that we need to address, or at least reconcile as we as we draft these rules. I mean, I think, I think, you know, I, uh, I touched on, you know, an example of kind of a statutory, you know, time de deadline, which is, you know, the, the end of the fiscal year, um, and the fact that there are some uh, things that have to happen at the end of the fiscal year that you don't know until you get to the end of the fiscal year. Um, so that's one example. Um, sometimes there are cases like with large capital projects, um, where you, um, you know, uh, an appropriation is made for a capital project, you go out to bid and, and there's an over, you know, the bid comes in slightly higher, you know, $20,000 higher. Um, and so you can't sign a contract unless you have the full appropriation. Um, so, you know, again, a situation where, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, April or May, the capital plan has been approved, the orders have been approved. Um, the school is desperately trying to get these projects done over the summer when the schools are closed. Um, and so having the ability to say, you know, this is a, this is a project that the finance committee and the council looked at. It's, it's more a matter of an additional funding allotment to it. Could you waive referral for that? So, um, you know, because in some cases, it's not only the time limit, sometimes um, bids only are good for so many days. You know, uh, you know, a bid may be good for 30 days in some situations or 45 days. So um, the clock starts ticking when the bids are open. So, um, so that would be, I mean, those are the ones that come to mind, um, you know, that might have a time parameter on them. Um, you know, 
Uh, obviously, if there was some kind of a emergency land taking that happened as part of a project where, you know, like we've seen recently on, you know, like the King Street project where they suddenly discover that, you know, a whole section of a street was never accepted properly. Um, and so we need to get it accepted. Um, and, you know, those property type orders go to the finance committee. So I think it's just really, you know, those types of um, things that are truly uh, necessitated by some time clock um, that just having the flexibility to do that. And then the other thing is I would just, it would be for the, for the finance director and their team and department heads to kind of n understand the rhythm of this, it would be great to sort of schedule the finance committee meetings, you know, so that they would sort of um, fall nicely between, you know, uh, you know, an order goes to a council meeting, then it gets referred um, and then there's enough time, you know, during that second meeting of the month or, or, or the second week of the month uh, between the first and third that the finance committee could then act on it and make its recommendation. Um, you know, ju just again, so that you're not sort of the same thing we ran into a little bit with appointments where there was a little bit of a time clock on appointments, but just, you know, just so that it doesn't um, take two and a half to three months to, you know, uh, transfer, you know, $20,000 into a, an account or something like that. That's all. So I think it would just be important to schedule it, to time it well, so that it could, everything could still um, function um, efficiently in that regard. Oh, thank you. And uh, you, could, you, could obvi you could obviously, if you weren't, if you wanted more time, you could obviously continue any item to a future meeting. So you could definitely slow down the process at any point, but I just think constructing the system so that it would work efficiently would be good. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Simon, did you have a question for the mayor? Yeah, I wanna talk about this issue of the referrals and the, the, the process that's been in place because my reading of the rules um, suggests that uh, there isn't a affirmative referral required by the city council to the finance committee before the finance committee can uh, exercise its jurisdiction uh, in the rules. So um, the, the, the matter about referral says the council may refer, but the, the finance committee along with the other committees have very specific jurisdiction already. So I'm wondering why, for example, um, why the administration couldn't communicate directly to the finance committee to have something reviewed and then brought to the council once uh, for resolution. I mean, I think that's sort of how it, how that's how it sort of the system kind of evolved because the mayor was the chair of the finance committee and set the agenda. And so it was really, um, that was sort of how it, how this evolved. Um, you know, it, it, it all comes down to Sort of the primacy of the of the body versus the subcommittees, and typically the body, the main body, is the one that takes action, including referring things to its committees. So, um, and in deciding what what gets referred where. So, and, you know, you could certainly adapt for that for finance matters, but you would be sort of setting up the finance committee as a separate sort of. Um, you know, it would have more power than the other committees and it would, and it would, you know, kind of be a gatekeeper above the city council in that with regard to financial orders. So I, I you know, it's, it's really, a, I think it's a philosophical question um, on the school committee, for example, um, you know, we have, um, you know, our, we have a budget and we have a budget and property committee um, and we do have, there are, there are, um, Things get referred to budget and property, um, but there are some accepted things that go straight to budget and property for review. Um, you know, the, 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 the superintendent will often do sort of a preview of his, of his budget with the budget and property committee as the sounding board feedback before it's presented to the main um, but those are kind of spelled out things. So you could certainly craft something like that, but, you know, I mean, generally, you know, everything comes to you that I guess that, that would be my answer. You'd have to set up a two tier system for finance. That's different 
from all the other committees like like we have now and give and give the discretion to go straight to finance. Yeah, I, but then if you really were to adapt the two reading thing, that would actually, you know, that would definitely, if you were going to treat the referral as the first reading, um, then that would actually, you know, that in and of itself would be great in terms of making the system more efficient because if you were to have to come to the city council if it gets preferred then it comes it has to be on, it would have to be on three a month and a half um, mayor excuse me i'm just wondering so is anyone else anyway. Mayor, uh, I don't know if anyone else is having trouble hearing you. Okay, so uh, would you mind turning off your camera to see if we if it will make the audio clearer for us? We'd like to hear what you were saying. It was a little um, broken up. How did we lose you? <laughs> um, are you still with us, Mayor? Okay. Um, hmm. I think we can hear you better oh. now. Oh, we I think we lost him. Awesome. Let's just wait and see if he uh, logs back on. I know he sounded like an echo. Yeah, the, the, the point I wanted to make here is that this seems to be another example of a, of a cultural practice that's been adopted over time that the rules don't require. Mm -hmm. And if you if you prefer to do it this way, you should write the rules that say this is the way it ought to be done. But there seems to be in the existing rules as they're written, the opportunity to already do something different. That's, that's the point I was bringing up. All right. While we wait for the mayor, I just want to announce to any, uh, to Councilor Foster and any other um, folks joining us that we, at my discretion, I moved um, a, the first agenda item before public comment and approval of the minutes because the mayor had a time, at, uh, like, constricted timeline. So um, after the mayor's done speaking, we will move on to uh, public comment. But I'm just going to give him one more minute to see if he logs back on. Yeah. I guess we should, um, does anyone, I guess we should, we'll move on. Um, oh, here he is. Hi, Mayor. I see him trying to connect his audio. Yeah, interestingly, there's no microphone visible, so I don't know if he has audio. Oh, yeah. Huh. Oh, there he is, the microphone. You think Are you with us there, Mayor? Did he disappear? Oh, no, there he is. Hi. <laughs> oh, yep. Can you hear us, Mayor? Mm. He's trying. Um, did, were there more questions from uh, committee members for the mayor? Just wondering in case we do lose him again. Oh, now we don't have your audio. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, we can't hear you. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we might have been wrapping up. Did, did was there any more? I think we were, Mayor. I think we're. Um, we're okay. I don't think there's any more questions for you. And we really appreciate you um, joining us here tonight. Thank you so much. I think he's frozen. Okay. Well, I think we're going to declare that one done. Thank you again, Mayor, um, Mayor Narkowitz. And we are going to uh, move on to public comment. 
Are there any uh, members of the public that would like to speak? You could raise your hand. Oh, and one process note. Um, okay, one process note. Um, I don't, for closed caption, Zoom has changed. And now you, you individually turn on closed caption under more at the bottom um, lower right hand part of your Zoom screen. Um, Right. And also, I want to make the announcement. Uh, I saw a question in the chat from Elijah. Um, but you, you may make a comment in public com comment. And, uh, um, but if you would like, I can recognize you during the deliberation of the Youth Commission um, agenda item. And we could, and then you can speak there as well. So I guess it's, it's your choice. Or you could do one or both. Um, that, that agenda item is two. It's a, it's a few a few agenda items down, so um, you can decide. Uh, I'm going to start with Megan, Megan Peck because her hand is raised, and then we'll go from there. Good evening, Megan. Thank you for joining us. You're muted. All right. So you weren't able to hear the smoke alarms that were. No, we did not. Okay. Um, so my name is Megan Peck, and I've uh, met most of you before. I uh, just want to say you're doing very timely and critical work, and I'm glad to have um, skimmed the video of your last meeting. And I thank you for the, the candor and the thoughtfulness and the thoroughness that you're bringing to this meeting. Um, I have a lot to say, but I do. Do I have the usual three minutes? Uh, it we have been kind of informal about that. So I would just say, I'll let you know if it's, you know, if, uh, I would just to proceed and I'll let you know if, if it seems like we're going on too much, but. Okay, I, I'm gonna try to speak quickly because I have to hop up to another Zoom call in oh, SS30. Okay. So I wanted to um, share two things that seem pertinent to the charge of the Rules Commission, the Rules Committee, but I'm really kind of uncertain that this is a proper context to bring up either of these matters because um, even though I'm familiar enough with some of you to have asked before the meeting. Um, I think that does speak to the problem that's raised by Member Baskin um, of that pervasive lack of understanding about what is within the purview and authority of the individual council subcommittees um, or even the voluntary commissions and boards. For instance, the Human Rights Commission has such a broad mandate, it's broad enough that anyone can bring forth what um, the city solicitor characterizes as any manner of societal ills, um, which often is really related to just the ordinary lack of you know, accessible parking and affordable housing in town and uh, what residents receive as like a lack of agency when they try to participate in their government. And you can imagine the, the lack of wherewithal of the four or five attending members that meet once a month when we um, politely, patiently, as you are listening to a stranger who, you know, could be quite emotional or even adversarial about and engage in this monologue about an issue or current event that's not on our monthly agenda or within our charter authority or current priorities. Um, and certainly I've been on the other side of that as well <laughs> in public comment. But um, the um, First part of what I like to share is, um, you know, as a co-chair of the HRC, I've just spoken to the director of Forbes Library, Lisa Downing. Um, she reached out to our commission after March to propose collaboration around racial justice education and programming. Uh, we're now exploring a training about implicit bias for the leadership of the city that would be facilitated by Hollaback, uh, uh, who are known for their uh, bystander intervention trainings. Um, I know that Councilor Maiori has mentioned this really well-regarded national organization and council before. Um, Hollaback offers really accessible, focused, efficient sessions led by staff of color for general audience. Um, they've rapidly expanded in the last few years to provide um, corporate and other institutional trainings as well that focus on conflict, de-escalation workplace in the era of COVID in addition to their well-known ones for marginalized populations, um, allyship. Uh, so we see an opportunity with the you know, new council term and with the 
large number of new counselors coming in. And um, excuse me, I'm going to turn off the audio for my second meeting here. Um, and you know, for for city staff who aren't first responders um, that may find um, this type of implicit bias training valuable, I think that our current mayor would probably be supportive of this initiative. But um, given this uh, our planning time frame, uh, we will be reaching out to the mayor elect to determine her or his interest in funding and promotion of this training. Um, and the HRC and Forbes will continue to coordinate and host it. Um, you know, possibly as part of the new council's orientation or you know staff's professional development. So the second uh, possible initiative of HRC is to begin working with the Forbes Library staff to promote and educate about the local history of Northampton. You know, the its settler colonialism as it relates to our marginalized populations and current tensions around housing. I think there's some resonance with this committee as well, because one project may be to for us to connect with local native advocates uh, to develop a land acknowledgement for our public meetings. Uh, once the HRC has a sample that feels collaborative and sensitive and relevant for Northampton, we will ask the council and other boards and commissions, especially those within educational or advocacy bent to consider adopting it for their own meetings. And we are not deliberately attempting to lengthen our city meetings. Um, we wanna be cognizant and clear eyed that land acknowledgements are, are fraught with controversy and can appear just to be performative gestures when they're not tied to meaningful reparations or other actions that you know improve the material political circumstances of indigenous peoples and they're you know often read in this safe space on conquered lands where there's no political consequences for those who participate in that ritual but like our council resolutions you know they are an, a statement of shared communal values and hopefully will serve to educate and remind us of missed history lessons um, sometimes they just have to proceed meaningful action. So um, I do have to go and thank you so much for listening to this over long monologue. I look forward to hearing the rest of the meeting on tape. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, Elijah, welcome. Yes. Um, um, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so I'll just start by um, uh, introducing myself. My name is Elijah. Um, 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 Bacall. Uh, I'm a junior at Northampton High School, and I'm uh, the, uh, the the new co-chair of the Northampton Youth Commission, along with uh, the other co-chair, Dahlia Brez. Brez Dahlia Breslow. Um, as a side note, I do stutter just so you know, so if at any point when you're talking to me or I'm talking and it takes me a longer time to get my words up, uh, that's why. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, work with you all uh, for the remainder of this term and uh, this year in this new capacity. I've, um, I've never been to, uh, this is the first uh, meeting of the council that I'm going to in uh, my capacity as, as co-chair. So I'm you know, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, work with you on and talk to you about uh, legislation and in initiatives for, you know, the remainder of the term. Um, um, and beyond. Uh, I, I, um, I'm at this meeting because the Youth Commission is on the agenda to uh, be discussed later on, and I do plan on, um, on um, staying, uh, staying on the call until then, in case there are any, in case during your deliberation there are any, uh, you know, questions or concerns that come up uh, that might be good for me to comment on. I, uh, um, if if you want, so I'll just stay on in case of that. But I, I'm just speaking now to introduce myself and to talk a little bit about, you know, the things that, you know, uh, you know, the the, the things that we might want to see changed about the way uh, 
the youth commission is framed in the city rules and the city codes. Um, I, I want to start by saying that, you know, I and the whole youth commission are, are, uh, you know, incredibly thankful that the city has given us the, you know, the trust and res responsibility that you do. It's, it's, it's a real pr privilege uh, for us to be, you know, young people fully getting to lead a, uh, a government body ourselves, and I'm I'm really grateful to have that opportunity myself, and to be able to you know, um, you know, spread that opportunity to my peers uh, as as well. But th there are um, so, you know, building off of that, there are a few things that um, you know, based on what the youth commission's work has been, like what what the business of the commission has been over the past few years, a few um. Uh, changes that I think could be made in the way that it's framed in uh, the city code. I'm looking at a chapter A of the administrative code right now, which uh, which describes the youth commission. Um, you know, just to better clarify um, what our work is in in you know in real life, um, you know, on paper. So uh, uh, one thing is we are officially right now called the Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission, I believe. Uh, full disclosure, we have been for, you know, in the recent past calling ourselves the Northampton Youth Commission um, uh, because we think it's more, uh, more accurately descriptive of the work that we do. Uh, most, if not all of our initiatives over the past year or two have been uh, working on ordinances with the city council, such as in our, our housing group and our sustainability working group and in our, our vote 16 working group, which worked a lot with the charter committee of the uh, city council. Uh, our, our education group has been working with uh, the school committee a lot and, and communicating with school committee members. Like I said, our housing group has um, communicated with the, 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 the housing partnership, uh, as well as the city council, like I said. So you know, although, um, you know, it's my understanding that the Youth Commission was originally formed as a, a body in the city to kind of advise the mayor on youth issues, I, we think that uh, a more accurate way to describe us now would just be like, you know, any other, uh, any other government body in Northampton who, um, you know, works, works, uh, you know, primarily with the city council as well as other um, bodies in the city as opposed to just uh, being a uh, being advisory to the mayor. Um, uh, so one other thing, uh, one, so, uh, we, and then the, the only other thing is that as I was, um, as I was reading just this, this brief uh, description in the city code to, today, it did say that um, uh, there shall be a youth commission consisting 21 members from the age of 13 through 18. So the other change we'd like to make is I, uh, you know, if possible, I would like to either, um, you know, greatly extend or uh, completely remove that limit for the reason that for one, I mean, just practically this has, this has not been observed over the last few years. You know, we've had um, the mayor come in and swear us in, uh, you know, in person and then remotely over the past few years where there, you know, there have been clearly more than 21 members in it. Uh, you know, no issue about that has has been raised. And two, you know, we're cog we're cognizant of the fact, um, you know, that that a lot of high schoolers in Northampton have obligations to work uh, after school, outside of school, have obligations to uh, take care of the, their siblings or uh, or 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 other family members. We don't, you know, we want to make the youth commission. Um, as as um, you know, equitable and rep representative of of you know what the youth of Northampton look 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 like and do, and a part of that is I think uh, you know removing the barriers to entry and allowing people to participate in it to an extent to the extent that they want, and um, having that kind of numerical limit, making it uh, running into making it potentially a competitive thing down the road where there are applications involved is really a kind of against. Um, you know the mission that we've that we've tried to set for ourselves um, over the past few few years. So those are the two. Um, uh, thank you again uh, for 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 listening. Uh, those are the two major changes that I think I would like to make to how the youth commission is uh, has been framed in the city. Like I said, I will um 
stay on the call until, you know, through the Youth Commission agenda item in case there are any concerns that, that come up that I could, 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 could address. But yeah, um, thanks so much. Thank you, Elijah, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, we have a couple more agenda items and then um, thank you for being willing to stick around. Okay, okay. let's see. Um, oh, I have a, I believe, is that empty box? Was that, is that Megan's? Is that, per, I see a hand in an empty box. Might Megan's have hand is still up, I think. Oh, okay, she might still be on the, well, I don't see any other public comment, so I'm going to read. Um, I haven't gotten to read it first, so I'm just going to have to just, um, read a comment sent um, from David Murphy, who could not join us, um, but wanted to, but wanted to, to comment on the finance committee. So here we go from David Murphy. Perhaps the most important function of the city council is financial oversight of the budget and the executive branch of city government. Not every counselor is a member of the finance committee, but every counselor shares the responsibility of financial oversight. The tradition of having the finance committee meet um, during the council meeting is to one, expose all counselors to financial orders or other matters before the committee. Two, allow every counselor to ask questions about the matter on the floor from the mayor or finance director who are most often in attendance at a council meeting. Three, quickly dispose of matters that are routine or that need action that evening. Uh oh, I'm screen sharing. Can you still hear me? Can you I don't still have hear me? to. Whoops. Can, can, you, can you still hear me? Yes. I, that, that was strange. The whole I, was, I started screen sharing and maybe that was interrupted oh. something un, unwittingly. Yeah, I'm having some very strange Zoom things. There's little black boxes, like little rectangles over Councillor Foster and Councillor Dwight. Oh dear. Um, that's that's very interesting. Well, maybe we, yeah, maybe I'll I'll just read it then. Continue reading it. Yeah, just in case okay. it's related to the screen sharing, I won't. <laughs> yeah, that's um, there's been glitches in Zoom lately. I've noticed more than there used to be. I don't know what's happening. Um, we had one during full council meeting. Okay, so we are at um, the, the having finance uh, committee meet during the council meeting. And so I think I said um, three, quickly dispose of matters that are routine or that need action that evening. And four, to help to educate new council members on financial process and procedure. If one of the matters before the finance committee meeting during the council session is determined by the body to require more public exposure, it can be continued to the next finance committee meeting, not held during the council session. Then adequate public notice can be given and members of the public can comment on the committee level, at the committee level with more and uh, give and take between the committee and public speakers. In the eight years I chaired the finance committee, we used our meeting outside of council to, one, interview auditors to perform the annual budget review. Two, review the results of the finished audit of the budget with the auditor and their staff. Three, sell or lease city property like the Nonatuck Preschool, Florence Grammar School, and the South Street School. Four, review the capital plan and five, hold public hearings on a financial matter when assigned to do so by the full council. The current process for the finance committee had evolved over time and been continued because it works, makes efficient use of the mayor and finance director's time, exposes all the councilors to financial matters. If a matter comes up during the council's finance committee meeting that you wish to give more exposure to the public, just keep it in the finance committee and continue it to the next finance committee meeting outside of council for comment. Do not make the process more cumbersome than it needs to be. David. Um, okay, so if there's, I don't see any other further public comment. So now we are at the agenda item. 
Um, let's see. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We are at approval of the minutes, actually. Um, move to approve the minutes, please. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please, Laura. I can't hear you, Laura. Huh, you know, Laura, you're, I don't see your mic. And, you're and muted. Councilor Mayori. Oh yeah, yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Simon. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. <clears throat> okay, minutes from September 15th, 2021 approved unanimously. All right, on to Agenda item, clarification and simple, simplification of finance committee recommendation. This agenda item is included to simply allow further discussion and clarification of the finance committee recommendation made at the September 15th meeting um, if called for. No specific change is proposed. Um, yeah, Laura and I had a conversation and realized we, we could benefit from just you know a few minutes uh, really clarifying this point. Um, so if there's any discussion around it, um, we can we have the space to do so. Yes, Councilor Dwight. So, uh, my understanding, or at least, uh, yeah, my understanding is that um, the consensus was that we, uh, and it depends on the next item in the on the agenda. Right. So I just oh, yeah. and that I'm going to refer to. Um, oh. Should we suspend the, the traditional way of we address two readings, then um, we in fact actually are already structured to function the way um, we've been struggling to try and figure out. And that is uh, financial orders and items will be introduced in the first meeting of the month or, or whatever meeting. And then subsequent, and then referred to finance, but in where in the finance meeting would convene separate from out of the body uh, and before the next meeting, where they will discuss and decide what should be referred to on the, well, actually, no, I'm sorry, I, I take it back. This is the way I was thinking, but the, the body here uh, generally considered that what we would do is figure out what would go on the, uh, the version of a consent agenda, items that would be pro forma that would be addressed at the next meeting, and then items that required more granular analysis and discussion would um, be referred to the finance committee, which, which um, if it had items referred to, it would convene be t previous to the next meeting, and then come back with recommendations that would be addressed and voted on in that meeting or continued if need be. So, um, and, I, and, and I still hold that that actually works out pretty well. And I also, even, even to the concerns expressed by Councilor Murphy, former Councilor Murphy, aspiring Councilor Murphy, um, that uh, those, those same issues would be addressed. The purpose of that also allows for greater public access for comment, discussion, and also for the council you know, the concern relative to um, staff time that the mayor brought up and that has been brought up. As I said, I mean, we've in the past, what has happened when we've had to have these financial orders delivered, the, the finance director has to spend an eternity sitting there waiting for us to get through the rest of the agenda. And sometimes completely unnecessarily, uh, particularly when they're making a presentation or whatever, we can that the agenda can be adjusted to accommodate that staff person. When they're going to a meeting dedicated exclusively to their uh, conversation discussion, they know that when they show up at the time designated, they, will, they won't have to sit there for hours on end waiting to see if there, there are questions for them. That's, and it seems to me that is a far more efficient and far more productive uh, uh, expenditure of their time and also as you know and to the mayor's points it's also important that you know there be a regularly scheduled time so that they can actually uh, prepare to accommodate that as, over the course of a year as budget items present themselves but that was my understanding of the, what we were what we were discussing or at least considering 
Thank you. I, yeah, I just really wanted to make sure we're all on the same page of understanding. Um, uh, Member Baskin. That was my understanding as well. I still like that. I still think it makes sense. I think we should move forward with recommending that. Okay. Um, uh, no chair, Simon. Oh, vice chair. Thank you. I'm you're sorry. Still, vice you're chair. Still in charge. I'm I just promoted you. you <laughs> Uh, we, did, behavior, yeah, we, did, we did, in fact, make a recommendation to do just that. Um, yes, yes. So, yeah. Right. There was just when when I was talking with lawyer, uh, lawyer Laura, Laura, there was some points of um, we just thought there was a, it was a little confusion and we thought it would be take the time to really make sure we we're on the same page. Yes. Um, Councillor. Oh, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Laura. I mean, Laura and then Councillor Foster. I don't know if it's my place, but the only question I had about the process was at what point the mayor would be making his presentation about the orders. Would it be at the council meeting when they're making the decision of whether to put it on the consent agenda or refer it to finance, or would it be at the finance meeting or, or both? Right, that's right. That's why we decided to put that on there. Um, well, Councillor Foster and then uh, Councillor Dwight. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Mary and Laura, actually, for putting this on the agenda, because I appreciate the chance just to make sure that we're all uh, in agreement. Councillor Dwight and, and Member Baskin, sounds like we are. Um, that was what um, how I remembered it as well. And Laura, my understanding or the way I, way I had envisioned it was that the presentation would actually be made to Council about the financial order, and then Council would decide whether to move it forward to the consent agenda for the next meeting or refer it to um, finance committee, but what that did is it allowed all of the council members to have that, that deep awareness of what's going on with financial orders. And then if it needs to be studied further, finance committee could do that. And so then probably the, the another question we'll need to answer and not necessarily tonight is what the structure or when we would want those finance committee meetings to be scheduled to accommodate that deeper review prior to the meeting. Thank you, uh, Councilor Foster. Councilor Dwight. Uh, Council Foster, I, I was going to say just that it, the the mayor, the mayor or their designee would be would make a presentation at the initial uh, introduction because, as the mayor noted, the mayor um, introduces those items, unlike the other items that we that we set our own agenda. In that case, the mayor should introduce it or their designee. Um, it's not required that the mayor could be the financial director; it could be someone in their office, but. The, the presentation would be made someone who at least um, more um, would be capable of answering at least more basic questions. Usually we don't have a debate during referral, um, but there sometimes may be some process questions or some other things that they would be able to address. But other than that, I, I, I don't, and then it's entirely up to the mayor because you recall and, and under the charter, basically we can invite the mayor. The mayor's not required to come, but and the same thing with the introduction of the finance committee. It's in the mayor's best interest if they feel it's in their best interest to come and make their presentation there as well. So it's it's not on us at that point, and and I think that works out fine. Uh, uh, thank you for that because that was the, the point that I we, that Laura and I were not clear, so that's why we we wanted to review that. Um, Member Baskin, this is a side note to this, but I. Wonder if, in terms of making the council rules more accessible, we might consider putting in the appendices, um, like in addition to defining things like resolutions and ordinances and orders and financial orders, which I also think we should do on the agenda template, which would be in the appendix. I also would love if we could make some flow charts, not to be a complete nerd about it, um, that highlight the path for each of these um, processes just because I think it would help increase public awareness to have a visual representation in addition to sort of the, the wordy rules. So um, that would be something I would be that, happy to help draft up. Right, I'm gonna make a comment. Yeah, because that's interesting, Member Bask and I often wanted, wanted something like that as well on the um, council uh, webpage. You know, just a little bit more explanation to the workings of council um, and the, the limits and of council power and such. So that's that's a thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, well, um, are there any more comments on this agenda item? 
finance committee. We've been talking about it for a while, huh? Dreaming about it. Okay, so now we are on to section five. Uh, section five rules, including second readings. So uh, let's see. I've been waiting for this one. And anyone have? Yes, Councillor Foster. You know, I, I just, I'm going to um, say that I remember very early in our council term, Councillor Dwight, I think we might have even been in person and you were ruminating on second readings and how much you disliked them. And at the time, as a brand new counselor, I thought, you know, I actually really like the second reading because it gives me time to ruminate and think and clarify. But Councillor Dwight, I have come around. And um, what, I, what I think, you know, we can consider as a council is that second readings don't need to happen uh, as a matter of course. But I think that what we might consider is making it a part of the process if a counselor requests one, that it's not like, oh my gosh, that counselor just requested a second reading, but that it, it could be a normal part of the process if somebody feels like they need more time or information was introduced at a meeting that they hadn't expected or something. Um, but as a matter of course, I, I don't think we should do them. Interesting. Uh, 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 Vice Chair Simon and then Councilor Dwight. Um, so I think fundamentally the issue is two votes. Um, it's, it's, it's being called two readings, but the, the rules require two votes on everything except for a specific list of exceptions. And I've always wondered like, why? I mean, when you have a vote, that's supposed to be the end of it. So that I do, however, see some value in the idea of two readings. If your intent is to uh, allow the public to know that there's an issue that's going to be decided at your next meeting, then there's value to, to introducing it without a vote. Um, I actually had some suggested language um, that I wanna offer, which is before a vote on a matter may be held, it must first have been introduced at a prior city council meeting. Introduction shall include a description of purpose and effects. Council discussion is allowed for questions and clarifications. That allows an issue to, to come forward for people to understand there's something to be considered. You can have some discussion if you want at the time, but the vote would happen at the, at the subsequent, the following meeting. Um, it eliminates two votes. It keeps two meetings of introduction or, or, uh, or a discussion of a topic. Um, if you don't, want to have any prior introduction of a topic before a vote, then we can, you know, just eliminate the section and the rules that, that require two votes. Councilor Dwight. To be clear, I actually, my objection was not so much to the two votes or uh, the consideration, although it is, but we've misunderstood the concept of two readings. Uh, it's to what Al was saying. Two readings are required. It is the first reading occurs at the introduction. The second reading comes at the point of vote. And for some reason, Northampton went off the rails at one point, and decided that meant two votes at each reading, which is not the case. It's not the case under Robert's rules. It's not the case under Massachusetts general law. It's not the case in under any other municipal system. So, you know, I think you retain the, the concept of readings. That's fine but don't call them votes. We've, we've turned them into votes. That's not the case. As far as the uh, luxury the Councilor Foster was talking about of, of someone who's not confident of the facts that are before them and not prepared to make a vote, they're actually, we already have mechanisms in these rules that allow for, um, you can table, you can postpone, you can have minority or majority reconsideration of each item. So there's there's about four avenues in which you can cause a second vote if necessary, if, if someone feels that those pressures are there. The reason we've never exercised those is because we automatically have two votes regardless. And in this case, to run more efficiently, to run in a sense that actually conforms with the proper definitions of what readings are, 
And the way we function under Robert's rules, which is allows for these opportunities, I think, you know, actually, I like Al's recommended language, you know, to thereby define the first reading. And then we can also say a second reading where the, uh, and this is, we've had some discussion about this, where it's, it's reintroduced for a vote, whether we're going to require the chair to read the entire document or, um, and that's, you know, I think, I think we can require that and then subject to suspension of rules in the case that, for instance, where we've had some things that could go ad nauseum and serve no purpose other than to hurt people and to cause someone to have a really painful experience trying to read that. But that being the case, I think what we're describing makes much more sense. It's more accessible to the, to the, uh, uh, to the public as well. It, it doesn't have these confusing terms. It makes sense. When you say a reading, we're reading it. When you're voting, you're voting it. Those, that, it should be pretty straightforward in, in Northampton's unique um, style. We've, we've never done that. And that's the thing that I've always took a scum or two. Thank you. Um, Member Baskin. Yeah, I like Al's, I, I like Vice Chair Simon's proposed language. Um, I don't think we should do two votes on things unless there's a specific reason to. And I think there are mechanisms in the rules to make that happen. I do, I think in terms of clarity of language, it's it would be clearest to say, and I think this is what's in Al's language, the first time is introducing it and the second time is voting. I actually think the language of reading is a little bit confusing too, just in that it, I think that's part of where we got in this trap of having to read everything out loud all the time, which we'll get to that next on the agenda, but I think is silly. Um, so I, I think the introduction, it's, it should be introduced in one meeting and then it should be voted on in the subsequent meeting. Um, my curiosity here is that list of things that are, okay, did you put the language? Yeah, that's perfect. I like that language. I think my question is about actually um, rule 5.6, the matters requiring one vote um, and whether these things, whether this is now unnecessary because everything needs one vote or whether there are any of these things that don't need to be introduced in one meeting. And then for example, like approval of the minutes, I don't think that should have to be introduced in one meeting and approved in the next. I think it should just be introduced and approved on the consent agenda in the same meeting. So I wonder if there's a way that we could preserve some elements of this list as sort of exceptions, things that can be introduced and voted on in the same meeting. But I would love to remove administrative orders from that because I don't understand why they're treated differently. Um, yes, Vice Chair Simon. Uh, Member Baskin is thinking along the same lines as me with this because if we got rid of requirement for two, then we don't need to list those requiring one. Um, however, if, if if ultimately we end up recommending the idea that it's introduced for discussion and voted separately, you probably still need a list of items that are exempted from that requirement. So Councilor Jarrett has his hand up. I don't know if you can see that right now. I can't, I, yeah, my my screen is very funky and um, I, I could, so I, so please let me know if, um, yeah, if people are, um, have questions or have their hand up because I can't actually see most of the screens. Does uh, Councillor Jared have his hand up? I, can, I also can't get to the, yeah, I can't get to the participant list either. Okay, well, I'm um, gonna recognize Councillor Jared. Uh, thank you, Councillor Maori. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry, it's very dark here. Um, the, uh, so I'm appreciating this discussion. I did wanna clarify the question of, uh, you know, for example, resolutions, would they be introduced? Just just getting the list of all the different things that we do and which which ones would require two reading or which ones would, would be introduction and then vote at a subsequent meeting uh, and which wouldn't. Um, I also wanted to point out an additional mechanism that I don't think we've ever, we've used in this term. I don't know if Councillor Dwight, you remember people using it, but it's called a charter objection. 
And um, prior to a vote, any counselor may delay uh, an item to the following meeting. Um, <clears throat> just a, it's kind of a, a superpower of, of one counselor. Um, <clears throat> so that's also a, a kind of a final um, way in which even if you know the, the tabling or the postponing is not does not work, then um, then that that's another another ability. Uh, my question was, so the introduction, there are many items that we refer, uh, ordinances and uh, zoning ordinances, um, of, of course, uh, how do, so we would have our initial discussion at the referral time. And right now, you know, when we, when we do the referral, it, it's, the discussion is limited to, you know, how are we going to do the referral? Um, is that, but, but instead, it sounds like, and this is where I would like clarification, this, it would be uh, opened to more broad discussion and that would be our, our first time and then it would be referred out and then it would come back and then we would have our, our vote. Is that what you're intending? Councilor Dwight? Well, if I may, so when it's introduced, um, you can have a more expansive conversation, but not deliberation. That's the most important part, I think. The, you don't want to debate it, but if you want to have questions and clarifications, I think that's appropriate, but it's not appropriate at that point to debate it, unless, of course, the council agrees that that's what they want to do and do it in that meeting. Hmm. Um, the other issue relative to resolutions, resolutions, as you know, are subject to referral, have been referred um, sometimes as a delaying tactic, uh, a strategic delaying tactic, you'll recall, on the uh, camera restriction debate. Um, there was a resolution as well as an order, and there was it was delayed by a counselor who referred it to committee in the hopes that it would slow it down by about two or three months, which in fact it did. But so, but that's I mean it's allowed. It's an allowed use, and 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 at times very appropriate. And and I'm sure that counselor would argue that was appropriate. So it's it. it and in a lot of, oftentimes, this is a, one of the things when Councilor O'Donnell was drafted the rules that we currently work under, it was, he was concerned about something that you see happen in the state legislature and had, had happened previously in the city of Northampton, that the rules were used literally to essentially destroy or kill uh, an, a, 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 an item, um, you know, in, in the legislature, they send it to committee, and if it's never addressed in committee, it dies there, it just dies and ignored. You can't do that here. All in, it's specifically stated in our rules that you have to address every item at some point. I mean, you can set up delay systems, but the fact is, is that it, it will not be delayed to death. And that's the biggest concern. And so far, I mean, you know, we haven't seen that happen with anyone in this uh, most in the last two current bodies, but it, it is, we just want to be mindful of that when we set up the rules, we're not setting up the rules for the people who will be sitting in this thing. It's the rules for whomever will prospectively be sitting in these places as well. So the resolutions can be referred. Uh, and and uh, whereas the sponsors would be expected probably to show up at, at, at uh, whatever meeting to um, wherever it gets referred to to make their case for their item. And um, that seems wholly appropriate to me. Um, so I guess uh, if I may ask one more question. Um, does that, so as Councillor Dwight described, it would be, we would not be, we would have one opportunity for debate other than that in subcommittees and such, um, unless, uh, unless we, again, just, unless someone decides they want to delay um, in whatever method they choose. And so I would have just asked the committee to um, reflect on that and make sure that is the intention. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, any more comments on section five rules and second readings? Uh, uh, Councillor Foster and Vice then Vice Chair Simon. I, I apologize because I was managing kids and dogs. Um, so I <laughs> I just want to be sure that I sort of uh, am, am up to speed with what we 
have talked about, um, which is the idea that many matters would be introduced at a meeting um, with the vote to come at the subsequent meeting. And then um, the work would be to, to make sure we hone down on exactly which matters um, would not be eligible for vote at the meeting where they're introduced. Am I, am I correct with, with where we're at right now? That's my understanding, yes. Thanks. Oh, and I like it. Okay. And she likes it. Okay. Vice Chair Simon. Oh, I'm already unmuted. Thank you. Um, but to Councillor Foster's uh, question, I mean, right now, the way the rule is, it says to be approved, every matter shall have two separate votes, except for the listed items in the, in the following uh, uh, rules. So it's set up right now that everything is supposed to be this way unless it's, uh, unless it's specifically exempted. Um, and my suggestion would, would operate the same way, which is that the, the text that I've sent in the chat applies in all circumstances, and there would still need to be a carve out for exceptions to that as, as there currently are. But the, I just wanted to add two things, because since we're talking about this section, there were two other small pieces, really housekeeping, that I wanted to bring up. One was um, uh, section 5.1.5 which I found amusing. It's, uh, it's titled Supporting Documents, and it says maps and visuals along with all other supporting evidence essential to a matter shall be presented in a clear and intelligible way. The reason I found it amusing, of course, is there's no way you can mandate that, and one person's clear and concise is another person's shambles. So uh, I would merely suggest that we remove that, that section entirely. Uh, the other one was section 5.8.1, um, which can, can only be eliminated, which is my suggestion, if we eliminate the two votes. So this is uh, what's called automatic carryover. And it says matters that have not passed the required number of votes by the end of the current session shall automatically carry over to the next session of the city council and remain in the council and all committees to which they have been referred to. And I think this gets back a little bit to what um, Councillor Dwight was, was getting at um, that um, there's a mechanism so that things can't just go away. So as the rules are currently written requiring two votes, that if something only has one vote, it, the council must finish that. Um, obviously, if you eliminate the two vote requirement, then this section isn't, isn't necessary at all. So that, that's my only uh, comment there. Thanks. Right, good point. Uh, Councillor Dwight. Uh, first of all, actually, good point. The, the uh, reason for the requiring the legible documents, uh, there was a history of uh, illegible documents, particularly relative to zoning or maps and the like. And I, I think there should be something where we can stipulate. Uh, it, it's essentially keeping the honest people honest. It's directing um, whoever is the presenter, if it's the planning board or if it is the financial I mean, you know, we used to get financial orders that were printed out in, um, at the time they were uh, printed out in Excel, but on Excel documents were so minute that literally it was absolutely impossible to see what it was. So in which case they were just, I mean, <laughs> so they were meeting the criteria of presenting documents with the documents. And this is before we were online. So we would get paper documents. They were completely worthless. They were just uh, uh, about half the council struggled to see what the hell it was. And the same has happened with some maps. So simple, you know, we were getting maps in some cases that were uh, delineating the outline of the border of Northampton with a, with a dot in the middle. And that was supposed to be some reference point that was supposed to mean something to us. So what we were asking for was something with something that would provide information for us as opposed, and, and by the way, they've, they've conformed very well since then. And that's, that's great. I don't know, you're right. I don't know if we need to stipulate that. Maybe this speaks to the culture argument. Maybe that culture has been established, but it should be. Uh, the reason I like the rule there is there's something we can refer to when we when we ask and demand to have those uh, up front as opposed to after the fact. Um, the carryover issue becomes pretty tricky on some levels there. And again, this goes back to um, the camera argument, oddly enough, we were under, ending the term, the mayor had vetoed the ordinance. 
And if there is not a response in a timely effect by the council to the veto, there's a very, there's a prescribed amount of time, then the veto stands. We were ending the term. The veto came at the end of the term. It was going to be very difficult to, we actually had to scramble, and I think we may have even had a special meeting in order to um, address the issue of the veto. And so in whether it carried over into the other term would have better not a jot. It would, the veto would have stood and then the, all the work that was put into that would have fallen by the wayside. Also, <laughs> It's, there's a difference between council session and council term. So as you know, you are all elected for two years and there's no offset. So it's the same body, the, that council changes and it's about to, for instance, a whole new council will convene in January as opposed to just the term ending with standing councilors. So I haven't thought this out about what that would mean about carryover, um, but it, it, my particular concern as, as uh, uh, co-chair Simon, I'm uh, vice chair Simon, stand corrected, um, suggested was that we don't want these things to die a warning, to die by, by process maneuver. Yeah. They, they, it's our responsibility to, to, I get phone calls while this happening. Uh, it's our responsibility to see these things through, own our vote, and make a vote. That's what we're required to do. So, Member Basket. I think we should look at the carryover language. I agree. I like um, Vice Chair Simon's language, as I said. A couple other things in Section 5 that just stood out to me in my scanning of it. Um, one is 5.2.2 about financial orders and that they shall not be voted. No order or resolution authorizing a loan, the levying of a tax or the expenditure of money with the exception of the printing of the annual reports shall be voted on by the city council until it's been considered by the committee on finance. Just flagging that in case that conflicts at all with the sort of structure that we just talked about of referring some things to finance, but just sending some things to the consent agenda. Um, I don't know, maybe the things that we're talking about are not, don't fall into the category of a loan, the levying of a tax or the expenditure of money. Um, like a transfer, for example, I don't think would fall into any of those categories, um, but I just wanted to flag that as something that might be worth thinking about. Um, and then the other thing I had a question about was 5.7, the enrollment committee, just because um, it's not with the rest of the committees in the same section of the, um, like it's not a standing committee, we didn't consider it with those. It doesn't meet really, it's just, why, why is it there? Uh, Councilor Dwight. <laughs> the enrollment committee actually is established by state law. Uh, essentially it requires signatories to items that the council agreed on. Um, it's rather perfunctory. In fact, the way it used to be assigned was whoever the two people sitting, the two counselors sitting to the left of whoever was the chair, simply because they were closest and it was easier to pass the documents for them to sign. Um, that's what the enrollment committee is. And um, in currently right now, I'm on the enrollment committee and Laura sends me a DocuSign item for each item that we vote and approve, particularly financial orders. And that's it, it. So yes, it is unique as far as committees go. The assignment is still made by the chair, uh, by the president, but uh, it's not one of those committees that everyone fights for. It just, it just doesn't, doesn't carry the august uh, standing that the other ones do. That's very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Okay, any more comments on Section five, second reading, anything? Uh, and I'm, I'm willing to entertain a motion as well. Um, oh, sorry, Vice. I, I, I defer to Al, please. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Vice Chair Simon. Hmm? I was just gonna ask you if you would entertain a motion because I, I think we're probably at that point. So uh, my motion would be to uh, recommend substituting 
the language in section 5.5 uh, to be um, this we would it would have a new title being matters requiring um, two readings and then the text would be uh, the text that I have in the um, in the chat before a vote on a matter may be held it must have been introduced at a prior city council meeting introduction shall include a description of purpose and effects council discussion is allowed for questions and clarification so that would be a wholesale language substitution for 5.5 Second. Okay. Uh, Laura, roll call, please, on the motion. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Vice Chair Simon. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Member Mayor. Baskin. Excuse me. Oh, oh that's, yeah, yeah Member Baskin. Vice Chair Simon. I just wanted to add a, a housekeeping second uh, motion on this, which is okay. to uh, on section 5.6 to change the title to be a matters requiring one reading instead of one vote. And then the text to be the following shall require only one reading of the council. And that aligns it with the new language. I second that. A motion a second. Um, Member Baskin. <laughs> um, I would like to propose a friendly amendment. I think I'm doing that right. Um, to remove administrative orders submitted by the mayor for either approval or disapproval from that list. Okay. Um, well, it, it's it's a friendly amendment, but the the proposer has to accept it. Yeah, I'm right. Curious. So okay. I don't I don't feel like I know enough to be able to say yes or no, and would actually appreciate if some discussion about that is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we can discuss that, right? Is that well, I'll second it for the I'll second that for the purposes of discussion. Discussion. Okay. okay. Yeah, I was just, I think the administrative orders often actually do hold a lot more consequence and need for debate than a lot of the other sort of pro forma items on this list that are usually in, um, often in the consent agenda, like approval of minutes and acceptance of reports. My experience in viewing council meetings has been that administrative orders are actually sometimes subject to a significant amount of discussion and deliberation. And so are, I think should be more akin to other orders and ordinances that they're introduced in one meeting and I'm voted on in the second, particularly because they're generally not particularly time sensitive. Uh, just is, can someone offer maybe an example of that? Cause I don't, I, I haven't watched enough to know what an example of an administrative order is. Like changes to the administrative code, I believe are oh, I administrative oh, orders. I see. Um, so like restructuring of multi-member bodies, particularly I think is an item of consequence that I think should be introduced in one meeting and voted on the second. Yep. Um, I, I'm happy to accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? So wait, do we need to second the friendly amendment? No, no. it's a bit, okay. been accepted by the proposer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we then? Roll, roll call, Laura. On the on the motion at with the friendly amendment. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Vice Chair Simon. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Excellent motion. Oh, Councillor Dwight. So now administrative orders are sitting in limbo. So you uh, better so you better designate how and they how they will be directed and addressed. Good point. Uh, just, yeah, uh, Councillor Foster, Member Baskin, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I um, administrative orders do often generate discussion, so I appreciate that. Can we put administrative orders then back in the category? With financial orders and and um, 
you know, the other the other items that need to be introduced prior to a vote. Vice Chair uh, Simon. I think the I think the language of the two pieces take care of everything because the 5.5 says this is what you do for everything and 5.6 is these are the exceptions to above. So if you've taken administrative orders out of the exceptions, they're in with everything else right now. Fair enough. Yep. Okay. Do we need to entertain a motion on that? No. Okay. No. No. Just a a, I, yeah, Councilor, uh, uh, Vice Chair Simon actually nailed it if, if, because right. Because we're describing the exception as opposed, and then it's everything else is presumed to fall under the aegis of the, the initial order. So, great, excellent. Okay, uh, looks anything else on section five agenda item? If not, we are moving on to the youth commission. Elijah, thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, Let's see, um, Member Baskin and Councilor Dwight. Um, so I don't really think this is in our purview since it's in the administrative code, um, but I did have a couple of thoughts um, for the mayor if he listens to this recording or anyone else. Um, I think that the it's not the mayor's youth commission in the administrative code, it's just youth commission. So I'm suspecting that the mayor's youth commission is residual language that could be eliminated without any change to administrative code or anything. It seems the official name of the body is just Youth Commission. So totally support the body naming, calling itself Youth Commission per the administrative code. And I think that the point about the membership count is a really good one and that that would be a great administrative order to, um, to alter that. But I think it's not in our purview. Uh, Councilor Dwight. Of course, I'm the one who introduced this or at least asked the discussion. And in fact, actually, I was glad Megan showed up too. Human Rights Commission, Disabilities Commission, the Youth Commission. Again, it comes down to issues of definition. Commission and committees are different things. I mean, the committees review internal um, matters and legal matters. And, 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 you know, as we say, we refer things to committee for further discussion. Commissions are external analysis that providing advice or there were the things that we were talking about when we were having discussions about committees. The Youth Commission, um, I was there at the beginning of the Youth Commission, I was there at the beginning of the Human Rights Commission in particular. Uh, Disabilities Commission has changed substantially. All those, those the uh, Human Rights Commission and Disabilities Commission were basically constrained or expanded under state law. So there's some things that we can and cannot do as or those commissions can and cannot do that they once upon a time did do. Um, youth commission is unique in, um, there are youth commissions throughout the state. Northampton's was different. There was actually a youth commission association, which we're actually not part of because we actually uh, bestowed upon our youth commissioners greater latitude and authority. Um, that they've used to good effect, as you've noticed. But at the same time, there is, right now, there's this kind of amorphous definition of what their, what their mission is. Um, and as such, it, it's, it's caused some confusion. And also, um, we're, we're, we've had some problems with violations of open meeting law. The state, if they were reviewing the way we conducted our youth commission, may, may be subject to criticism. Other, usually they would avoid that. There wouldn't be that. Um, there, there wouldn't be that challenge. But the fact is, our youth commission now is currently actually generating law. A uh, law that's subject to uh, the possibility of, of uh, liability and a uh, more recent one is is there is a possibility that there could be um, legal action, in which case, if we're not found functioning and performing in the way that state code requires, it could be um, voided and there could be other consequences. I mean, no one's going to uh, commission jail, but the fact is that 
we, we could lose all this hard work. That is why, and this, this basically what I was entreating us to do was to ponder it. And, and Elijah's absolutely right. And I, I, I've asked the commission to consider this too. The other unique dimension of the commission is it changes mid-year for, in most respects. It changed, they, they're, uh, you know, they come back in September, they're gone during the summer, but we, in many cases, we lose over a third to a half of commissioners in the inter intervening time because they go on, they graduate. Um, we have to figure out no other commission actually functions like that. Now, is Elijah's was elected interim uh, chair with Dahlia, but the fact is, is there going to be another election when we convene again in the new session? And 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 Elijah, I I think Elijah is likely to survive, but I it's not a given, and we can't play that out in the rules. So there's all sorts of anomalies here that we don't have to answer. It's just ones I want to consider. And there, that the future council going in and the future youth commission going in with the future mayor going in to have an expansive and thoughtful conversation about this very useful group, but let's define them in a way that conforms with state law and also their charges. Because actually, the right now, the youth commission's victims of its own successes and good work. Um, so is part of, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm particularly concerned when we start to proceed with, with as we create law, which is ultimately on us. But the Youth Commission has served as co-sponsors on no less than five laws in the city so far that are on the books. So that there's something that's remarkable. That's remarkable. But at the same time, it is subject to, uh, to uh, challenge and we should be prepared to meet the challenge should it come. And at this point, we're not in a very good position to do that should that happen. And that's my concern. So, um, you know, and I, when I get a chance to speak to the Youth Commission, I will say, and I, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, I serve as a council liaison, which is another bizarre thing. I'm the council liaison, we had a, we had a, council liaison to the Human Rights Commission as well, but that wasn't a council committee. It's not a council committee. I don't, I'm not a voting member. I'm just the annoying old guy sitting in the corner in this case. And, and so as such, it's, <laughs> there's, the lines of accountability are very vague and not clearly defined. The uh, protocols and rules are a little squishier as well. Membership, has always been open, um, and Elijah's right. We haven't we haven't obliged we haven't abided by the 21 person rule. And at any given time, 21 30 people may show up. They usually show up for the swearing in, and the hardcore the true believers stay. And that's usually about 14 or 15 people on, uh, as a rule, and um, they stay committed and devoted. My other concern about the youth commission has been it is homogenous is very homogenous. It, they are all excellent students, all from the high school. And it's tricky. We need a broader representation of opinions, cultures, classes, children who aren't in school, children, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I even use that term. Commissioners who are not in school, commissioners who are couch surfing, commissioners who go to the uh, Smith Vocational, uh, com commissioners who are of, the proper age who are count as Northampton residents um, should be members of the commission. They're not excluded, but the fact is, is we've never been very successful in trying to recruit them. We've on occasion we have, but I, I've, we've had members from the Cutchins programs. We have members from uh, Smith Vocational. We, we have had some houseless um, teenagers who actually did had no identifiable address, but we made an allowance and that's actually enriched the conversations because there's pushback and, and, uh, and other issues. So that's, uh, so that's my entreaty is to basically ask beyond this committee, but the future council and the future mayor and the, and the future youth commission to actually 
come up with something that can be meet legal robust requirements. Thank you. That was a good point about the, the legal accountability issue. Um, I think Member Baskin had a comment. Oh yeah, it was quick. I just I think the answer to the twenty one members is from Mass General Law. Um, the the relevant Mass General Law section says the commission shall consist of no less than three no more nor more than 21 members so actually in having more than 21 members you might be in violation of mass general law mm -hmm. regarding youth commissions more broadly um so that's that's probably where that 21 number comes from and why it's that yeah i wonder if you can have like associate members that wouldn't count towards that 21 yes council dwight well, insofar as actually we don't conform with any of that law, <laughs> establishing youth commissions, we this is something that actually was created by Claire Higgins in response to something that I continue to complain about, that we continue to talk about them without them, that we continue to make rules about banishing children from the steps of City Hall because they're hanging out and uh, and other issues like that or skateboarding issues and things. We were making all sorts of rules pretending we knew we remembered what it was like to be teenagers, or at least condemning ourselves, condemning them based on what the way we were at that age. And those without a conversation or discussion with them. So Claire Higgins, to appease me, established this kind of this made up version of a youth commission, something that would be different and unique. I'm moving on. Doesn't have to be anything to appease me anymore. That's and Claire Higgins has certainly moved on. She describes herself as a recovering politician, and I think that it, it, there is that. And the youth commission, as I said, has evolved into something that that exceeds the expectations of youth commissions in the state law, which was basically this sort of perfunctory, you know, isn't it cute? Look what they're doing, type of arrangement. We actually have a highly functioned, viable system here that provides substantive contribution to the discussion of governance in, in, in Northampton. And, and it will even become more important if the, the uh, charter change that they created and advocated for of 16 year old votes comes into effect. And at that point, I, I just, I think there's an opportunity here, but as I said, as it's evolved, it needs that clarification because the most critically, it, it, it has to survive challenges to what they do, the work they do. Um, I just want to let Elijah, you. I'm recognizing Elijah Bacall. So if you have any comments at any point, I, I'm also having trouble. Um, if you, I'm not always seeing raised hands. So just let me know um, if you have a con any kind of comments or questions, Elijah. And um, yeah, and I think uh, Vice Chair Simon has his hands up. I'm in. Yeah, um, oh. Did I? Or Did, um, I? Yeah, Elijah, do you want to make a comment and then? Um, Actually, uh, I'm, I'm, Vice Chair Simon can go first. It, it might be easier to like hear all of the, the different feedback and then have me um, ask my questions um, after that. Okay. Yeah. So Vice Chair Simon. Actually, I just wanted to respectfully ask what the connection is between this topic and the city council rules, which is our charge. That is a fair question. And there isn't one, to be honest. Uh, well, the reason I asked it to be considered under the rules under committees and discussions is there's no there's no agency the, there isn't a, a, an agency that actually could be considered under the mayor's office either. So, in fact, it, it is it, it's me make, taking a squishy issue that doesn't really have a direct corollary with what we're discussing under the rules. There's no rule. There's no action item. Essentially, as I said, there's no action item, at least to this commission because we don't have commissions. Okay. Okay, uh, so Elijah, did you wanna? Uh, sure, yeah. Weigh in? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Councillor Dwight, uh, for 
uh, that feedback. That that was very helpful. And I'm, you know, there there were some things in there that I didn't know, particularly around, you know, the the history of the youth commission, some, um, you know, legal scrutiny that could potentially come up. But a lot of it, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I I was, you know, have been aware of these issues, and I'm glad we're um we're 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 raising them. Uh, so it's my let me just look over my notes for a second it's um it's um it's so to clarify what you said about uh the the membership number so the the massachusetts state law only states that 21 member limit does that apply to just youth commissions or does that apply to all government okay so it just applies to youth commissions Okay, and City Councilor Dwight, I, uh, you're saying that it it um, the Northam the Youth Commission is essentially like a different legal construction than other youth commissions, even though we have the same. It's a different construction. I don't know if it's legal. There's the rub. <laughs> right. Okay. Um. 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 Okay. Yeah. But but as of but as of now, it is. It is a different thing. Okay. Do you think is that is um? Do you think that clear is clarifying that potentially going to be something that we need to do in terms of making sure that the youth commission is legally sound and will hold up under challenge and scrutiny? Yes, I do. I think that's very important. I think that would be the most in char important charge of the youth commission, the common council, and the mayor right. uh, early on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 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 okay, so we'll, we'll just have to figure out, um, we'll, we'll just have to figure out how to, um, how to kind of think about, um, you know, if we need to, if we need our, if we have, if we are over the membership limit, how to like, potentially um, not maybe have people just be members of subcommittees like our, our working groups or, or, or other, other things we can do around that or, or just not have as many members. Um, in terms of how the Youth Commission kind of like conduct our affairs more soundly than we have in the past and, and really follow uh, open meeting law better, it's my understanding that the main two things that we have not done in the past and that we are going to we've already talked about trying to do very consistently this year is um, is uh, like sending our agendas in on time for full group as well as working group meetings. And then when the youth commission is uh, either co-sponsoring an ordinance or, or, you know, writing a statement or something like that to make sure that that language is voted on by the full commission. And that, that, that vote is, you know, clearly, um, like accounted for in our in in our 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 minutes. Is there something that I'm missing there in terms of real blind spots that the youth commission has had in the way of open meeting law compliance? Um, yeah, the the way the subcommittees convene and conduct business the same way. It has to be done the same way, um, and has not. And that that when a subcommittee convenes, that they have to submit their agenda and right. post it before 48 hours before. All votes or recommendations should be recorded in the minutes and then forwarded. So, not I mean, you guys have been, yeah. And and and, and I, I I have to, in deference to the rest of the committee members here, this isn't this is something we should probably talk about the youth commission. Elijah, right. mostly because this, it doesn't really have any relevance to the members here, and I don't want to—I don't want to overload them on that. But the, yeah, I mean, at the next meeting, since you set the agenda, you might consider this as an agenda item to be addressed, and I'd be glad to participate. And I'm sure any one of the uh, members here would, if interested, could also come and and. How about solicitor Seawald? Would that be a and, good addition? We've had solicitor Seawall come okay. every year to, to discuss open meeting law and things, but the, the body is amorphous, it changes. Uh, mm -hmm. And as I said, I mean, I think right now we probably have like 30 members sworn in and, and that's not who shows up and, yeah. and they change. So, but it's worth 
it's particularly for the two interim chairs to to be apprised of what what the challenges are here. Yeah, that's a big responsibility, yeah. Elijah. That's a big responsibility. Um, and I do wonder about what the definition of member and you know uh, uh, in, in, in the MGL and what that could look like in terms of still including um, interested participation from the youth community. Just wondering about that. Maybe that's something Solicitor Seawall would be able to, to uh, weigh in on. But yeah, um, I, I think that could be helpful. Oh. Oh, yeah, no, please, please uh, go on, Elijah. Oh, okay. Well, I was just going to say, like, uh, you know, like Bill said, I understand this isn't directly related to the work of this committee, but I just like to, um, you know, thank you again for discussing this issue. Uh, I think it's really important, and I look forward to um, City Councilor Dwight uh, hopefully uh, discussing this with you more at, at, at one of one of one of our upcoming meetings. So, thank um, you for. Thank you for participating, Elijah. Uh, very, very illuminating. Okay, so any more discussion on this topic? No, no motions. Okay, okay, let's see. Where are we? Uh, eliminating reading documents into the record. Oh, Councillor Foster. I'm just going to back up for one quick second on sure. um, the Youth Commission, and I just sure. wanted to verify, Councillor Dwight, did you, with with adding this to the or requesting this be on the agenda, did you have any desire to sort of talk about the struct, the council structure as it relates to the Youth Commission? Um, you know, like how some commissions have actual council members. This one has a liaison. Did, was that something that you wanted to that you wanted to bring up for discussion, or or not? Yes, and and. And now that I think about it, maybe maybe it's not appropriate, but yes, I mean the the it was always understood it was it was as a commission it, it advised the mayor, but point in fact, actually almost exclusively all uh, dealings with anyone in the uh, government was with the council, and as such, but without any council constraints or or, or you know you know direct oversight. And so I think to go backwards, we have to define what the Youth Commission is first before we figure out whether it does come under the auspices of the council and whether the council should prescribe rules for it or if it comes in the auspices of the mayor or whatever. So I think that has to be determined first. And I, and, and I think it can, it's just, it's challenging and it's, it's a moving target, so. So right now, I don't, I don't think it's appropriate to have a discussion about that because I don't, it might not apply. And then the recommendation would have to be um, to the, 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 the new mayor since it requires an administrative order. Correct. Just clarifying. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, any other youth commission comments? No. Let's see. So, yes, eliminating reading uh, documents into the record. Member Baskin. I don't think this is the reading the documents out loud into the record. It's in the rules anywhere, at least not that I've been able to find. I think it's a cultural issue. I personally find it of very little value. Um, the, current council president um, who is on this call is really masterful at reading the items into the record really, really quickly. But I think so quickly that it, people couldn't comprehend them if that was the primary way they were trying to understand the item. So it feels like it's not, and the items are screen shared, they're linked to the agenda. They're like, they're accessible in a number of other ways. It feels to me like it's actually doing an access disservice to take the time to read the items out loud into the record. I think it lengthens the meeting substantially and um, sort of the benefit drawback of that. I think that it is of more, it's more of a detriment than it is a value in my opinion. That said, ultimately, I think this is something that is really like, mm, 
I don't know that we need to make a rule about it as much as just like, I, I, I'd like to highlight, this is a cultural choice that the council is making. The council does not need to do this. The rules don't prescribe it. And it, there doesn't need to be any kind of allowance made to say, we're not going to read this. It doesn't have to be a motion about it. The things just don't have to be read out loud unless you all want them to be read out loud. So I just would hope that the council could take that and um, maybe make a different choice about that, particularly when meetings are long. I think there's totally could be a value to reading certain things out loud, but particularly when it's a list of numbers, it's a financial order, reading it out loud is, of, I think, no benefit. So I just wanted to introduce that and sort of, that's all. That's all I had on that. Yes, um, Councillor Foster. This is more of a question that I don't know, Laura, if you have the answer or I'm happy to seek the answer. Um, but uh, Member Baskin, your point about how the documents are linked um, to the website, and it had me wondering if our website is fully accessible to people who are using screen readers, because that would be a reason um, to read out loud, and, and um, but it, that can be handled in a different way, um, and, and I don't know. Laura, do you happen to know? I don't know the answer to that. That's something we could find out, because that would be, you know, just a piece of it, um, and, and I'm happy to, to find out. And I can inquire. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Member Baskin. Yeah, also to make sure the PDFs that are being generated are accessible and accessible to screen readers as well. Um, but that should be, I mean, it's a basic tenant of accessibility compliance. So I would hope that the right. city's website is screen yeah. readable. That would be quite concerning if it isn't. Right. Uh, uh, let's see, a vice chair, uh, Simon? Yeah, hundred percent with uh, with member uh, Baskin on this. Um, clearly, some members of the council don't like this norm, which is why it's on our agenda tonight. But uh, member Baskin is one hundred percent right. There's nothing in the rules about this, and uh, it's really norms versus rules. And norms are very powerful, as we have already seen. There's a number of cultural norms that the council has in place that have no relation. To the rules and so simply if people don't want it anymore they just need to stop um councillor dwight one of the things that concerns me is that um this could be exploited by a less thoughtful council or council president and items could be introduced that the public would have no idea what they are other than the brief descriptive narrative which often employs acronyms for instance particularly when it relates to zoning issues, for instance, you you get an alphabet soup that does not offer clarity. And zoning items uh, usually come to people's attention when they're introduced into the uh, uh, council meeting. Um, not that they have to be read in full, but I think some descriptive language that does not employ acronyms that actually uses full terms so everyone knows what the hell they're talking about. And I have to say that there are counselors, and I include myself, and sometimes these acronyms come up and I have no idea what they're referencing. I don't know what it means. Um, I agree there's insane boilerplate required. I mean, that, you know, was, much of it was drafted back in the mid uh, 19th century that has language that, that's really difficult to navigate and really just painful and does not impart information to folks. It just brain kills them. So I, I have no problem with that. It, I don't, but eliminating it entirely or eliminating some descriptor of the item before the council would make me feel uncomfortable. I, I would, so if, if, if each item comes up with a descriptive narrative that essentially describes the nut of the item, without the use of acronyms with clear, concise language, then I'd be all for this. Uh, member, um, yes, Member Baskin. I didn't have a full thought, just that if there was a less thoughtful council right now or in the next term, they, they already don't are not obliged to read it. So they, mm -hmm. they could do it with it entirely without any change to the rules because it's, it's purely cultural, it's purely a norm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it sounds like there's two parts of this 
thought process and recommendation, one about how, how you know, explaining further to our public and, uh, via the website and, and our agenda and a recommendation about um, this norm and not engaging in this norm. Yes, Councilor Dwight. So yeah, just be cautious about the term norm. There are actually, there are things, for instance, that are not described in the rules like uh, style sheet. Uh, Laura actually drafts and creates the document that looks as the agenda. None of that's dictated in the rules. Uh, it is a style sheet essentially that um, Laura has evolved uh, as created herself, but it was also, there was a template that preceded the ones that we currently use. Um, and that in, in some way is a norm as well, but the fact is it has value. The purpose of it is to impart information to the council and make it uh, facilitate the discussion. Um, absent those, in, the, in that case, those norms and those, those uh, templates, um, you, the experience is much, can be much different and actually much more opaque. And so that's my concern, that's all. Any other comments on, or any recommendations? Councilor Dwight. Uh, my recommendation, as I said, if, if if each item could be introduced with a descriptive paragraph or a one or two lines that, that is clear and concise, does not involve acronyms, um, be read as each item comes up, as opposed to item 12.005, and then have everyone vote on that. That's not transparency. So if, if that could, and, and again, this... That doesn't have to be in the rules, um, but then uh, you know it would be something that maybe Laura would draft. But it would have to be in conjunction, probably with I don't know. It would have to correspond. You know, it, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know who would basically have to have oversight on that. But I think you know, deferring to staff in that case is is probably appropriate. I don't want to make more work for Laura. She does a great job on this already, but. Um, I, I would feel a lot more comfortable if, if, if some standard or some rule were established or at least protocol. Hmm. Yeah, um, Vice Chair Simon. So this is, this is for the introduction of a matter before the council, right? Um, so I'm wondering if the language that we've just adopted on the two readings actually is sufficient for this. I'll, and I'll read it again. Uh, before a vote on a matter may be held, it must have been introduced at a prior city council meeting. Introduction shall include shall include a description of purpose and effects. Uh, council discussion is allowed for questions and clarification. So I guess the relevant sentence is introduction shall include a description of purpose and effects. If you feel that's sufficient, that's sufficient. If not, we could actually modify this language to whatever you think is necessary to accomplish your goal. No, I agree. I, I accept that. I think that that uh, it just indicated that that would also be on the agenda. So the agenda, as it's presented to the public, when it's available to the public, that they would be able to read that descriptor and it would be available to them. And how we phrase that, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could. I, I'm blanking on a good word, but you want it to be digestible to the public, you know, you want some practical amount of clarity but I, i'm not thinking of the word right now i mean we do do that now although if you'll look at an agenda you if you i mean there's shorthand because laura doesn't want it and we don't want to have laura write 40 pages of stuff for people but the fact is that there is a shorthand and sometimes that shorthand it, it means something to us but it might not mean anything to the public or my mm. might obfuscate and i it, that's my biggest concern. So I think actually to uh, Vice Chair Simon's recommendation, I, uh, I would subscribe to the language. And if that can be uh, also incorporated on the agenda as before the items are introduced. I think, you know, I'm just gonna comment that I, a broader discussion, perhaps a new council, you know, this is maybe a resource that the council needs, you know, 
whether that's you know a physical person like an intern or you know you know paid intern or some 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 sort of community outreach well not really outreach but really focusing on um, making our meetings and our agenda um, user friendly uh, to our to our community it's just something that we could think about but. That could be a whole role. That sounds like it really could be a whole role for a person <laughs> beyond Laura. But anyway. So is that um, so? Is that an, um, a motion to recommend that? Or are there any more comments? I mean, that can stand as a motion to recommend, but yeah. Okay. It, it's not a rule. Right. So, okay. So you're saying we don't need a second? No, yeah. It doesn't need to be voted on. I mean, it's something yeah. we can forward and have on the, when we debate it on the floor, but. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna issue a report to, to share with full council from the select committee and I, we can certainly include include that in, in the report, just to bring light to it. You know, it might really clarify, I don't know, frankly, if I don't know that I knew or other counselors know that it's kind of a norm, for lack of a better word, and not a rule to read, um, you know, to read these documents. So just even stating that might be of use. <laughs> it is worth asking the solicitor if Massachusetts general law requires an actual verbal recitation of, of items. Interesting. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Here. I will I will uh, make sure we run that by and by, by our next meeting. Um, any other comments on this last agenda item? No. Okay. Um, well I think we're done with our agenda. Madam Chair. Um, hmm? I move to adjourn. Well, do we have our Second. next meeting? Second. Oh, we're we've scheduled meetings. I just wanted to clarify them since uh, <laughs> there's been some um, there's been some lack of clarity. So would you, could we just take a moment to? Um, I actually don't have my calendar. Laura, do you have your ca calendar? I think the next two are October twelfth and twenty sixth. I think I understood you guys to decide to meet um, the second and fourth Tuesdays on an ongoing yeah. basis. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Sounds good. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, hmm? it, it, as I said, I won't be able to make the twelfth. Just but that okay. that go proceed without me. Yeah, you don't want us to. Okay. No, don't don't reschedule that. that I mean, there's. Your time's too short. The pressures are too intense, and uh, it's, it, well, the, the, yeah, I think I I have a I have an all day meeting that starts from eight and goes until like uh, yeah, nine o'clock that night. So yeah. there's nice. yeah, yeah, and I would I wouldn't I think I think you can soldier on without me. Well, when you see the agenda, Council Dwight, you could send any um, comments, so, and I will read them aloud. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> or not. Okay. One one final motion that I interrupted. It, it's on the floor. A motion. Oh, it's on the floor. Okay. Yes. Roll call. Yes. Roll roll call. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Vice Chair Simon. Yes. Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Yes. Move to adjourn. Okay, adjourn. Uh, thank you, everyone. 804, Thanks. I'm impressed with us. Good night, y'all. Okay. Yeah. See ya. Take care.